Good morning. I'm going to talk today about how efficiently quantum systems can perform classical computation, which is, of course, the same as how efficiently any physical system can perform classical computation. I'm not going to talk about complicated Schrodinger cat state kinds of <laughs> evolutions, which are hard to protect from decoherence. I'm just going to talk about how well quantum evolution can manipulate classical information. Okay? The talk will have two parts a macroscopic part where we're talking about computation in the classical realm, classical computation in the classical realm, and a microscopic part where we're talking about mapping deterministic classical computation onto deterministic wave function evolution directly. Now, in both cases, at all scales, there are resolution limits that come from quantum mechanics. These are generalizations of uncertainty bounds. They're bounds on distinguishability in time and space that arise from the wave-like nature of energy and momentum in quantum evolutions. And in the macroscopic limit, these bounds make uh, any classical evolution effectively finite state. And so classical mechanics becomes a finite state computation with rates of change in time and space governed by average energy and momentum, and it achieves the quantum bounds. So it's maximally efficient doing what it's doing. Of course, this is not as trivial as you know, physics computes itself as fast as it can, because we're saying that classical mechanics is actually a finite state computation and it's maximally efficient according to quantum bounds, okay? In the microscopic realm, we actually have to figure out how to efficiently map computation onto, onto quantum degrees of freedom. What we have in mind here is making some regular arrangement of atoms, a perfect crystal, so that we uh, match the locality and the uniformity of physical dynamics and then arranging for there to be a computational dynamics, like the computational degrees of freedom, which are a subset of the physical degrees of freedom, which have an isolated autonomous evolution, which is exactly suited to computation. And of course, that subset of the physical degrees of freedom will have reversibility, local interaction, conservation of energy and momentum within them, and so on. And so it's essentially classical mechanics, again, at the microscopic scale, doing the computation. So let's begin with the resolution limits and their macroscopic consequences and we'll get to an ideal mapping of classical computation onto microscopic degrees of freedom later. So in the classical realm, the idea that wave behavior has resolution limits is something that we see all the time. In fact, waves limit what we can see. The particular form of the resolution limits that generalizes in the quantum case is the Nyquist signaling rate bound. This was discovered by, or enunciated by Nyquist around the same time that Heisenberg talked about quantum uncertainty bounds, which are also resolution bounds. The idea is that if you try to use a signal 
for communication, there's a finite minimum distance that you, can, that you have to have between the chosen signal values. You can't put them as close together as you like. And the reason you can't put them as close together as you like is because the width of the range of the frequencies in the Fourier decomposition of this wave is always finite. That's because physical media have finite responsiveness. And in fact, this finite width of frequencies, this finite bandwidth, actually determines the minimum spacing directly. Uh, intuitively, if we were to double the range of frequencies that we allow for the signal, then we could take the Fourier decomposition of the signal and replace all the frequencies with double the frequencies, leaving all the coefficients the same, and we would get exactly the same evolution, but twice as fast, the same sequence of chosen values, twice as fast. And in fact, bandwidth is the maximum number of distinct, state, distinct values per unit time for a communication signal, for just for wave phenomena here. Now, if we put the distinct chosen values as close together as possible, as close together as is allowed by this bound, that actually determines all the coefficients in this Fourier sum describing the signal. And that means that these chosen values are all the information that's there. From an informational point of view, this continuous evolution in between the discrete values, it's pure interpolation. It contains no information, no additional information. All the information is uh, in the discrete values. Informationally, this continuous evolution is an illusion. Now, all of these properties are true in the quantum case as well. Uh, any quantum evolution can be described as a superposition of frequency components. This is the expansion in the energy basis. <coughs> and energies, of course, in units where Planck's constant equals one are just frequencies. This is exactly a frequency decomposition. And just as here, if we double the available width of frequencies, we can make everything go twice as fast. Uh, and in this case, if we have a certain minimum spacing between perfectly distinct quantum states, we can make it half as great. So the quantum evolution, uh, the quantum distinct evolution can be twice as fast. Now, this, the use here of bandwidth, of the absolute frequency range, uh, is kind of arbitrary because exactly the same argument could be made with any sensible measure of the width of the distribution. For instance, if we used the average frequency minus the lowest frequency, then that's, you know, there's some shape of the distribution which has a certain value for that. If we doubled that width, we could double all the frequencies and again make things happen twice as fast. So any sensible frequency width doubles number of distinct states per unit of time. And this is a sense, a particularly useful one because the average energy is always a finite value in a quantum evolution. So you always get a bound here and the average energy is a conserved quantity and so this defines energy as a distinctness resource. Energy is the number of distinct states per unit time, the maximum that a physical system can have. Now, we could proceed similarly in space. This could be a spatial uh, wave 
spatial frequencies, momenta are spatial frequencies when h equals one. And so we get very similar bounds, but this bound here, this particular bound depended on there being a lowest uh, frequency, a lowest energy eigenvalue. And in the momentum case, momenta can be from minus infinity to plus infinity. There's no general lowest momentum. Nevertheless, since energy and momentum form a four vector in special relativity, we expect that if there's a bound here, that energy bounds distinctness in time, somehow momentum should bound distinctness in space. And in fact, there is such a bound and relativity tells us exactly why and how to interpret this bound. So let's think about relativity for a moment. Uh, in relativity, there's a complete separation between the behavior in the rest frame, the dynamics in the rest frame, and overall motion. And for example here, whatever, if we were looking at this system, this some system at rest, there's some number of distinct states happening inside that system, but there are no distinct states due to overall motion and no momentum. But if we just move relative to the system, we see distinct states because the system is in different places and the system has additional, it has a net mo momentum and it has additional energy, which is all moving in this direction. Now, that additional energy of those momentum components, it, it's all positive. And so in fact, we end up with essentially a lowest eigenvalue for the momentum and we get a bound like this. But this is a bound only on distinctness due to overall motion. If we were to look inside the rest frame, uh, the system there could be less localized or more localized, but that doesn't affect our bound here. Um, we're only talking about distinct states that arise because of overall motion. We count the states in the rest frame separately, okay? Now we can make these bounds even more parallel by thinking about the total energy in a region. The um, ground state energy, the vacuum energy, vacuum state energy in special relativity is always zero. That's the only relativistically invariant value it could have. And when we take the, that energy as zero, the average energy is in fact the total relativistic energy in that region. And so we get a bound like this. And now if we think about a macroscopic limit, the classical limit, we don't get infinite resolution as we tend to think of classically. What we get instead is that the system achieves these bounds. And as we set up here, a system that achieves these bounds, uh, the distinct states actually have all the information about the sequence of the dynamics. Uh, the intermediate continuous states can be determined by interpolation, and there's no additional information here. And so uh, in a classical evolution, there's really only a discrete evolution with no information in between, no state information in between. And so we say that classical mechanics is effectively finite state. And the analysis of physics in the classical realm, the quantities that are used to analyze it, are counts. I mean, you count finite, you, you analyze finite state things by counting stuff. So for example, in this system here, where we saw in the lab frame 
a certain energy that derived from the rest frame dynamics and some additional energy that derived from the motion, that total energy times the time between these two events gives you the total number of distinct states we see in that frame. And the momentum times the distance that the particle travels between the two events is the number of distinct states due to our relative motion. And the total minus the ones due to motion give, uh, gives us the ones that are not due to motion, which is the rate of distinct change in the rest frame times the time in the rest frame. And so the invariance of the time energy interval is just uh, counting. So our conclusion is that classical mechanics is finite state and counting uh, defines basic physical quantities. Now let's think about uh, ideal computation directly using wave function evolution. Now we know from the example of quantum computing that determinist wave function evolution that can do computation and that classical computation is a special case of what unitary wave function evolution can do where we don't use these extra operations that entangle the ones and zeros. This idea though that computation is a special case of quantum evolution is kind of inherent in classical lattice models, classical lattice gases such as the Ising model, which actually is in the same universality class in terms of phase change behavior as real physical systems. And you could attribute that to the fact that it's a perfectly good quantum evolution just using these kinds of operations and not these ones. We can generalize these kinds of classical lattice gases uh, to include energy and momentum conservation with particles hopping around on a lattice. So this is supposed to be a time history of a collision. And what we have in mind is two particles come in and we arrange the nature of the particles and the direction of the motion and so on. So that at integer times, the particles are all found at lattice sites. And so we have a discrete lattice version of a classical mechanical system. Of course, in between those integer times, we can imagine the continuous Lagrangian dynamics, which defines energy and momentum in the usual way as arising from continuous symmetries in time and space. Now, if we want to implement a model like this, as a subset of the degrees of freedom of a microscopic quantum evolution on a uh, some sort of crystalline array of stuff, then as this particle, this bit, this digital thing moves from one spot to another, the time for that distinct change determines what the minimum average energy is and the distance determines the minimum momentum. We have energy and momentum directly inside of our computational degrees of freedom, and those bounds are achievable. And so this is very similar to the macroscopic case where we can have classical mechanics with finite state as a computation. In this case, the, this particular uh, collision that I've shown is non-trivial from a computational standpoint, because if this particle were just all by itself and didn't hit anything, it would end up here. But because we have A and B coming in, we get something here. If A came in by itself, we would get something here instead. And so this is actually uh, doing logic and slightly elaborated models like this can be used to build arbitrary logical circuitry inside of our 
classical computing substrate and uh, do whatever classical computation we want. Now, cl uh, classical lattice gases are famous as models of hydrodynamics. In this case, uh, just having conservation of energy, momentum, and particles, and not and having enough symmetry, discrete symmetry, in order to not have extra conservations, um, gives rise to realistic macroscopic hydrodynamics. Uh, but if finite state, if classical mechanics in general can be th thought of as a finite state computation, that means that we should be able to uh, do similar kinds of simulations for almost any classical mechanical system. And of course, um, we could uh, just do a wind tunnel experiment for hydrodynamics, but there are great advantages in terms of uh, flexibility and ease uh, of trying different things. Uh, in having your simulation be a computation, and we can do it massively on some array of uh, crystalline stuff. So we get both bulk simulation of classical mechanics and any kind of logical computation we like. Uh, and they're both essentially classical mechanical at the macro scale and at the micro scale. So to summarize, resolution limits in the wave-like evolution of quantum systems arise from the uh, wave nature of energy and momentum in time and space and average energy and average momentum govern the maximum rate of distinct change in time and space for any physical system in the for very large classical systems, uh, those bounds are achieved, which means classical mechanics effectively has is a finite state computation, which has interesting consequences for uh, understanding uh, physical quantities in the macro in the classical realm. We can also uh, implement uh, efficient computation at the microscopic scale you directly using unitary evolution of the quantum wave function, uh, perhaps arranging a perfect crystal of atoms to have computational degrees of freedom, which evolved classically, which ends up being much like classical mechanics again, but with finite state, which is actually realistic for classical mechanics. So three related papers, the last one should be available shortly. And I thank you for your attention.